Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Global Men's Summit with a focus on masculinity in business. And today we are going to deep dive with another epic lineup. We have men speaking from Indonesia, Mexico, Australia, South Africa, and North America. Heading us off today is the one and only Neil Fisher who has spent 22 years in the entertainment industry, 13 of which with Davis Films as the head of it and working on the Resident Evil and Silent Hill franchise and his own movie, Sushi Girl. He also leads Dungeon and Dragons games streaming and he has done music videos and so much more and today he is going to talk to us about masculinity in Hollywood and the gaming industry. Neil thank you so much for being on the summit today we're super excited to have you. Well thank you for having me um, it's a it's a both an honor and a pleasure and I think this is a it's a great uh, a great thing to start um, you know these these uh, these summits are are uh, long. I think uh, they're definitely they've been uh, needed for a while, and uh, this is a good opportunity to start. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so as as you said, I I've worked in the the film business for about twenty two years. Uh, I, I was head of Davis Films, the Los Angeles branch. So we. Uh, we headed up films like Resident Evil franchise, the Silent Hill franchise. We made uh, it, films such as um, uh, Domino and uh, yeah, and Imaginary Dr. Parnassus, uh, Solomon Kane, and most recently Lucky Day. So it's, it was a pleasure working with with uh, you know top top notch uh, people in Hollywood and uh, getting to travel around the world to do so. Um, but I also have a strong background in, in comic books, tabletop role-playing games, video games, uh, and, and, and other forms of entertainment. And uh, so clearly the idea of how men are represented and the voices that we have in, in inter the entertainment business uh, plays a lot. It affects, you know, uh, how, how, uh, men and and even you know children and women how they see men and how we are expected to behave uh you know i mean we have we're all very aware of of the you know the unrealistic expectations uh especially you know body image that that women grow up with uh and and so but we don't talk so much about those same images that we have for men uh, and and the expectations of, you know, I mean, you know, I think yesterday's uh, seminars were wonderful because many of many of the speakers were talking about how there's an expectation of when men show any emotion outside of joy or, or um, that that they're they're immediately assume that they're going to get violent and you know it's, you know and they're dangerous and and you know and obviously. Part of that is is from uh, you know the reality that that there are that there are problems in, of about violence uh, in our world, but also in in that we watch movies and TV shows and and comic books that immediately uh, and video games that 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 the, the primary focus it's normalized to be to be violent and it's you know obviously it's entertainment. Uh, but it does it does have an impact on how we how we uh, view ourselves, what is normalized, and what we come to expect. So um, my background is a little is a little interesting because um, I was diagnosed uh, as 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 severely hyperactive as a child, and so uh, we often have issues with with boys um, getting, uh, getting diagnosed with ADHD or hyperactivity because uh, of, of the, the high energy and outgoing behavior. And obviously uh, young girls are often told to sit down and be quiet and, 
you know, be proper girls. So, um, but instead of putting me on medicine, uh, as doctors had suggested, my parents got another opinion and we, we controlled my diet. So I was put on a modified Atkins diet um, at around age five. Uh, and uh, it, it, I mean, really, you know, limiting the amount of sugar so I couldn't have um, uh, so any soda, uh, could have no candy, no cookies, uh, pie, none of it. Um, it was even it was even limited to uh, yeah, I could eat two slices of whole wheat bread a day. Could have a couple uh, like a couple strawberries or a couple slices of an orange and things like that. And it was primarily uh, meat and vegetables uh, that I that I consumed and 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 then. Uh, my parents put me on a type of exercise program to kind of get get that uh, you know get the energy that gets built up when you're sitting in school all day not moving, and you have uh, a lot of energy that that definitely causes a, a kind of a, an energy buildup. So you know it's not not completely natural for uh, five, six, seven, eight, ten year old to sit for for hours at a time so uh uh yeah so that was that was an interesting thing because again as was mentioned in previous uh uh speaks yesterday um the expectation of little boys to sit all day long uh is, is not necessarily realistic so uh and then you know when you Kind of shame them into, into that they're behaving badly. Um, you know what's going to happen. So, but uh, so then I moved to uh, an Indian reservation uh, and grew up there, and um, and it, it was very enlightening, uh, to say the least, because uh, you know, during the day I was, I was a bit of a minority. Uh, one of the few, one of a few white kids in the school, and then I go home and you watch watch TV and and uh, and everything was predominantly white, so and male. So um, I think from a very early age I was starting to learn about um, representation and voices, and and so you know in. As we know in film and television, uh, what is what is popular and what is put out uh, is is and what we see is often um, uh, shows some of the more negative aspects of masculinity. I mean, I remember growing up and watching early James Bond films where, uh, you know, he was he was a womanizer. I mean, even even, you know, to the point of, you know, being physically abusive and that was normalized. And what does that say to, to children? And what does that, you know, so, um, and because it's normalized, people don't really talk about it very much. And so I, I have really um, found the, you know, the, the Me Too movement and, and, you know, and, and newer feminism uh, movement and, and and a lot of this dialogue that has centered around feminism and and uh, and terms like toxic masculinity, um, I I've, I've found that those discussions were important, but then it seems like we uh, um, like anything. There's a pendulum, and you start at one end, and you you then you swing all the way to the opposite to to, to kind of self-correct. And so we end up with um, the idea that um, men's voices have been heard for long enough. And, and we, we self-correction is, okay, well, let's make women the, you know, the, in, in films, the violent aggressors and the, you know, the kit, the, the, the badass assassins, which is totally fine. And, and, I admit I I like that too, but 
but it doesn't really uh, talk about the uh, positive aspects of you know what what are positive examples of of masculinity in men uh, and and how does that um, impact society as a whole when you, when you have um, millions of people around the world watching it and and consuming it and and it, and even if you know, I mean there people have their TVs on almost all day long. So even if you're not paying attention to the show uh, or the film, uh, it, it's it's running in the background. It's 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 constant. We are constantly bombarded by media, um, you know, social media, television, magazines, comic books, everything, and, and music, which I I don't know as much about. But so the ideas that we have of masculinity. Um, are, are presented to us in all those forms all the time. And, and so it's important to know that, that we have positive representation of what masculinity is and, and how, how do we as men um, represent the, those positive aspects. Um, so there's a big movement here in Hollywood to diversify the people that are in charge of making films and making television. Um, everything from you know, studio heads to uh, directors and writers. So uh, it, not just behind the camera, but in front of the camera. So we, obviously we have uh, female leads and female supporting cast. Uh, that have increased in number, and and that obviously is is a wonderful thing, but uh, we also need to to kind of switch that mentality a little bit, and and not just replace the 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 men with the women, but also replace the the what we might we. we what we might consider some of the toxic aspects of masculinity, um, some of the extreme behaviors that we see in film and television with more positive ones. Uh, and, and that can be done in the writing process, in the, in the story and film development process. So uh, we need to have uh, more enlightened leaders uh, in, you know, that in our film, our television, uh, development and production um, added to that. So, and and obviously that's one aspect that I I love. Uh, my specialty is in film development. Uh, so I will read a script or look at a, a project that is um, maybe a comic book or a video game or a tabletop role playing game. Um, or someone's novel. And then we decide how do we adapt that into a uh, film or television? Uh, because since the medium is different, the pacing is different, how you tell the story is a little different. Uh, and so things don't always translate um, perfectly. So uh, one of the ways that I have um, tried to make a positive impact is not only in hiring uh, uh, women as writers, but also in hiring men that aren't just going to follow those long-standing tropes of of uh, of you know, men. You know, how many times have we seen uh, you know drunk fathers, you know, uh, physically abusive boyfriends, uh, and and those are real. They happen. Um, so. Uh, but if, if that's the focus, if that's all we see in, in our media, then, then we're not really pushing how we can make a positive impact. What, what are, you know, my attitude has always been lead by example. And face it, the, the truth is, is that film, television, and other entertainment, 
they they are you know, subconsciously leading the behavior of of all of us, telling us what is okay, what is not okay, uh, and and so and the same thing goes with 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 comic books, and there are some really amazing independent uh, films. Uh, now that uh, I mean, streaming has become more and more popular uh, and uh, more widespread, people are making choices to, you know, instead of go to a movie, uh, watch a TV series on Netflix or, or uh, watch um, Hulu. And, and so we, we have slowly been uh, opening things up for different voices uh, and different attitudes within within the entertainment business. So uh, I think that is a, a wonderful start, and uh, um, and we have a long, wonderful process. Uh, so um, I when we'd go to the question and answer session at the end, um, it I would be really interested to hear some of your um, ideas. And opinions about shows that are that have been have been making a positive impact on on people, um, and what are some of the positive changes we can make? So when we when we dial back to the the filmmaking process, uh, film and television, uh, the the first thing we do is we look for a, um, a an intellectual property. Uh, and that can be, you know, a book could be, and, and so one way we can start at the very source is looking for positive examples within, within uh, books, novellas, um, you know, and real life stories. What are some positive real life stories of men that are, are leading positive lives with positive examples, men that have perhaps overcome uh, a hardship um, and, uh, and really taken a turn to, 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 to change their lives uh, and, and change instead of just going on autopilot or just instead of uh, following some of the, the standardized behaviors that we've been told. So, uh, so choosing um, stories, real life stories, books, novels. These are these are one place we we can change. Then the next thing is studios and and film production companies make. Uh, we hire people to write. We buy scripts and we also hire people to write scripts. So again, it's all about the stories that we want to want to tell. And one thing that it's important about the film business is that we are, we are both leaders, but we're also a bit reactionary. So if, if we put a project out there and it doesn't make money and it, it doesn't have an audience, then it, it's not likely going to be made again. So one thing that we uh, as an audience uh, and you know, fans of film and television, not consumers, is make a point to to consume the shows that, and support the shows and films that we think are positive examples. Uh, you know, that means sharing them on social media. If we think something was, was a really great example of, of, of masculinity, of positive male behavior, uh, share it, talk about it, and uh, discuss it. Um, I think these are these are things I know that when I make when I make films uh, as a former teacher, uh, I'm a bit of a, an educator in general. So um, I want to tell stories, but I also want to educate people. I want to get people to think about things. Um, uh, those are the things that have motivated me. What films? And TV shows in my past helped form my my personality, inspired me. Um, and, you know, obviously, uh, anyone that knows me would say that 
uh, martial art films have, which the irony is that you often think martial art films have a lot of violence in them. Uh, but, and, and they do sometimes, but the interesting thing is that there's often lessons in, you know, in, in films that are made by, you know, like Bruce Lee, for example, um, that, you know, that try to also share uh, the true uh, heart and meaning of martial arts. So like, like, like Karate Kid growing up uh, as an example, we talked about that yesterday. Um, the, you know, Mr. Miyagi was, was, was the closest thing to a pacifist you can find. Uh, and, and so the martial arts for him weren't about being a badass. They were about uh, learning, learning and teaching self-discipline, uh, self-control, um, to be intuitive and aware of your environment, to, to harmonize with the people around you and not, and not force them to be something they're not or to be, or push yourself upon them. And so those are, I think, wonderful examples of, of just be positive behavior in general, but especially for men, um, to, to explore, I mean, martial arts has been a huge, uh, positive impact in my, in my background, martial arts can be very entertaining visually, uh, there it's a great output for, uh, for, to get exercise, um, especially in the time of COVID where we're all, you know, many of us are social distancing and trapped, uh, martial arts is something um, that uh, there are Zoom classes you can take if you're not, if you haven't done much already. Um, some martial arts uh, don't, don't require partners very much. You can do kata and forms uh, and, and really um, learn to get a sense of balance, in, inner balance and, uh, and, and self-control. Learn to learn to change how you think, so that it's not it's not reactionary. That you are um, that you're you're keep you're keeping calm. You're harmonizing with with others around you. So and and so making entertainment that is you know film television that is both entertaining. Uh, it can be exciting, but that also has positive messages and lessons within within those shows is something that that I personally always strive for and as an audience we can view them and share them so the uh, and the next aspect um, is is in is in um, hiring people from all different um, crew members so it, all different crew members make a difference in, in Hollywood. And uh, as we know, representation is important. So, uh, but if, if you have men that are, you know, they're, you know, people that work on the camera, people that, uh, that work in catering, people that work with lights, people that uh, build costume, make costumes, build sets, uh, build special effects equipment, uh, build props. I mean, all these things uh, are 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 aspects that um, in the film business that you might not think have a whole lot to do with masculinity. Uh, but let's say, for example, uh, when you look at um, uh, the star of a of a film, are they super muscular and ripped like the Hulk? Uh, you know, I mean, I love the Hulk, you know, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I love the rock. And uh, um, I love how he is really inspiring uh, people in in positive ways. He, you know, I mean, I on his on his social media, he's always giving uh, very positive advice to people to be uh, kind, to be self motivated. But you also look, uh, his physique is not is not something that every man can can do. I mean, it's, 
uh, you know, I mean, he's phenomenal and he definitely inspires me. Uh, the older I get, the more I'm like, wow. Yeah. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to pack on a few pounds on my arms, <laughs> you know, but, but the reality is, is that, is that that's kind of, that's kind of the movement we see almost all uh, male leads looking like that. Um, I, I, <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, let's see. is there something wrong with my, my mic? Okay. Um, so we have, uh, male leads that always, they, they're, they're just, they're ripped and they can be a positive example for people, uh, to have motivation to really motivate you to improve uh, your, 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 your physical well-being and your health, uh, and, and, in, you know, inspire you to be better, but it can also put pressure on you, uh, put pressure on, on men to, to have the six pack abs, to have the, the bulky arms and, you know, big muscles and, and, and be, you know, physically, uh, impressive. Um, so, it, uh, it, it can definitely um, uh, change the attitude and expectations of people. So um, maybe having more realistic, uh, you know, more average people uh, physically uh, isn't a bad thing. When you look at the you know, film history, um, people that were um, uh, leading actors in the in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, uh, were were not as uh, just you know at peak physical performance like a like an Olympic athlete. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so there there are definitely some um, avenues in which we can um, change the physical appearance of of our leading men uh, and they can be physically impressive but still be a positive example. So um, let's see, what is next? Um, is the, I'm just, uh, I need to interrupt for a second. Is the camera, um, I'm seeing um, someone else as the main, I'm, I don't know, is maybe my, my thing is, I can see everybody and you sound just fine, Neil. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I wasn't sure. Um, great. Great. So you're, you're all good, my friend. Okay. Wonderful. I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Cause it was, uh, uh, my camera was doing something a little wonky, so. Technology, life yeah. through us the loop sometimes. <laughs> well, thank you very much, thank you. So, um, yeah, so um, I guess one thing that, again, in the, in the, the Q&A section that we're going to arrive to uh, shortly, um, I would like to really hear back from what are some of the positive aspects of masculinity that masculinity that that we would like to see as a group um, of of men see more more in film and television and also in you know comic books and video games. Um, the so when we're talking about video games, um, it's very uh, interesting because we have had recently um, uh, we talk about gatekeeping people that you know. Traditionally, film, television, video games was kind of thought to be predominantly viewed by, viewed and especially played video games played by, by boys and men. Uh, those statistics are actually quite different now. Um, last, last I was reading about statistics, over half of the people that are playing video games are women. And it's 
you know, girls and women. And it's fully, it's an interesting representation of, because our population is, is slightly skewed more towards, towards female. So it, it, it makes sense that, that you would have um, that representation uh, be reflected. And, but, and so we've been hiring uh, women more and more as, as uh, you know, developers uh, in video games, writers, developers, uh, and, and we're, we've went slowly, but surely been adding women as the primary or the lead actor or lead character in a video game. Uh, that's still, still behind the times. Uh, for example, the most recent Assassin's Creed game that came out uh, is you can choose. You can choose um, um, a male character or a female character. Uh, and, and it's interesting how different aspects within the game um, make, uh, allow people to make different choices that would be uh, you know, violent, nonviolent, um, uh, you choose, you can choose your sexuality. You can choose, uh, you know, the, you, you basically a reflection of, of real life in that, in that we have every different type of person under the sun here and, and you know, in, in the real world and that that is absolutely acceptable. And, and many of those choices, you don't, you don't have to get violent. You, there are there are nonviolent options options of of solving problems uh, through uh, through you know being a good speaker um, making uh, making choices uh, by helping people out uh, providing you know if, if you if you see someone needs medical assistance you can help them uh, and and so it's really nice to see that 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 those those aspects are being brought into games as as video games become bigger and bigger in our society and and uh, um, what is it even even Minecraft had uh, it's not a game I play but Minecraft had a, a virtual uh, election in the game itself. And so, uh, so people playing the game, both young and old, could uh, could learn about different, you know, what what aspects, what what issues were the politicians pushing upon, and uh, what did they represent? Um, I know that that the, the selection was super heated, and uh, there was a lot of you know, a lot of opinions, strong opinions. Uh, about the candidates, but what I love is is that again, as a former educator, is that something as incredibly interactive as a video game, where you're playing a character that's not you, you can explore uh, your own attitudes uh, and your own theories on different aspects, on you know aspects of masculinity, femininity. Uh, you, know, um, you, you can make choices in the game uh, and learn from them. And, uh, and as an educational tool, video games, I feel are really the, the, next, the, the next big, uh, in, the biggest influence on, on society and what is, what is normalized. Um, what we think is normal, what we think is okay. And so I, as a, um, as a content creator in entertainment, I've, I've been thinking and working towards moving more into the video game industry, uh, just because I think that uh, when people are playing a video game, it's not, you're not just watching. You're not just an observer being told, following the storyline but you're actually interacting, you're making choices. And, and those choices can be, we can put positive examples of masculinity right into these choices uh, and say, okay, do you, wanna, do you wanna have a violent uh, solution? 
Do you want to have a nonviolent solution? If it's a nonviolent solution, what solution do you want? What, uh, you know, what, what is it to, what are the aspects? What do we think of as positive examples for, for men? And, and uh, what, what can we do in the video game themselves, right? So uh, what, are, what are traditional masculine behaviors that, that should be changed? Uh, and I'm not just meaning the the aspects that we commonly that we kind of currently label out as toxic masculinity, but things about the you know like men feeling pressure to uh, to to provide for the family. I know I'm one of those one of those guys. I mean it, it's 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 ingrained in me, uh, and and I certainly feel on one hand it's very important for for any any responsible adult to understand that you know to be responsible for themselves uh you know i as an only child also want to be responsible for taking care of my parents when when they're not able to take care of themselves anymore so um but it's very interesting that that um i have always felt the pressure to um create a, a safe home uh, and a stable environment for for you know uh, a wife uh, children uh, and and to give give uh, you know my my partner the the option that would would she want to stay home when we have kids does she want to work when when we have kids uh, but that that never never crossed has never crossed my mind and it certainly isn't socially acceptable uh, in general. We might say it is, but it's not socially acceptable for the man to stay home and take care of the kids. And there's still a lot of men that, that, that I think feel um, a, certain, a certain sense of, of ego or pride uh, if, if their, their female partner is earning more than them or or more successful or more has a more powerful position uh and and that is something that that i think yes that many women might complain that that men aren't uh aren't being supportive but i think it's actually uh that men should be able to embrace that i mean that would be a positive thing if i have a partner who's who's extremely successful, you know, in film, uh, in my, in my business, I, I would be proud of her. I would be excited that she is successful. Uh, and I, I, I don't, wouldn't particularly care who makes more money. Um, and if, and, you know, I mean, traditionally in, in, uh, society in American society anyway, uh, if, you know, the man would earn more money and if the man had a job that, that suddenly moved you across the country, well, the family moved across the country. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, but so the question was like, like, what happens if, if a woman gets a better job, do we move across the country? And now we narrow that down a little bit more and we say, okay, uh, would, uh, would, if, how would the man feel about that? I mean, would, would he be insecure? Would he be happy about that? I mean, obviously there's always challenges uh, in a move, in a big move uh, for a family. You're leaving friends, you're leaving, potentially you're leaving family, you're leaving a job that you might like. But, but uh, I would love to see uh, positive examples in film, television, and other entertainment where where the man would be would embrace that, would be excited about that, and and be you know beyond the typical you know that that everyone has challenges during a move would be would it feel any internal sense of 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 shame or resistance or responsibility? in that they would just embrace the fact that she's uh 
got a wonderful job opportunity and that she's successful and that and that as a as as a family unit it's an improvement for everybody so anyway i i'm not sure about uh, uh the time um we're getting i think we're getting pretty close so um why don't i why don't i open it up just so we have uh i know there's people here that might want to have questions or have comments so why don't i just go ahead and open it up to to comments uh questions now and uh we can we can all have a open discussion about about i know there's a lot to digest and there's this is kind of an introduction there's a lot to discuss about masculinity in hollywood entertainment and and film so i got a question for you neil yeah where do you think the film industry is going uh, in light of the pandemic with uh, burying the movies and the shows and things like that uh, post all the things that have been happening with Black Lives Matter, with the Me Too movement, with all of that? Where do you see? Oh, that, I mean, I mean, obviously uh, there's, there. I feel, um, everything is a double-edged sword. Everything is is a rose with its thorns. Um, and and sadly, as I mentioned before, I think the 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 pendulum always always just swings. You know, there's momentum, and and you need momentum to make any kind of change because people, even ourselves, we look. You know, the the devil we're comfortable with is worse than than the unknown, right? And so. That's true when it comes to exercise. It's true for, for anything in our lives. And Hollywood and entertainment business in general uh, is very averse to risk. Mm. So, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's all about money. I mean, it, I mean it's, a, it's a film business. You know, I mean, it's, it's just like any other business. It's all about making money. What makes more money, right? And, and there's a lot of risk involved. If you make a movie, that doesn't sell, uh, doesn't you 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 lose a massive amount of money. Right. So, to, your your question is multi-tiered, and I and I and I appreciate it. So I'll uh, kind of cover several of the different aspects. Uh, the first one you mentioned was about streaming, uh, or about about the pandemic. So in general, um, the cost of making standard live action film and television bare minimum has increased by over 20 percent uh you i mean that's that's just bare minimum i mean e each film project is a little different uh but uh for covid compliance it's just it's just a flat 20 percent you know i mean it, it, maybe maybe there are some brilliant producers one of my Specialties is making a film that looks like a big budget movie for for you know just bare bones. I mean, I made the movie Sushi Girl, uh, and you know, and it uh, people are shocked when they see it that it wasn't uh, you know you know five million. I mean, obviously, every everything changes with technology, but yeah, I I filmed that movie for $290,000 and it has Mark Hamill and Tony Todd. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful film and I'm very proud of, very proud of it. Um, but uh, it would have been a lot, I would have been able to make it for that price in the time of COVID. I mean, um, COVID compliance would, yeah, you have to have extra staff. Uh, you, I mean, the, you know, the changing rooms have to be different. The catering has to be different. All food service, you know, because you have to feed everyone. Everyone on the movie has to be fed. Well, <laughs> I, you know, so people are getting, in, you know, like individually packed meals. And and there's, um, I love making, well, in my movie sets, in my film sets, I love uh, um, integration. I love, I love the atmosphere of family. I love that in all the projects I've done, whether it was on, you know, on Silent Hill or Resident Evil or Lucky Day or Sushi Girl, they were all completely inclusive. So when you, 
the A-lister, unless they were like eating in their trailer because they they don't want they need to keep their mindset for a for for the next scene or whatever. Uh, everyone ate together. I mean, you know, you, you you'd go in and you'd have you'd have the star of the of the film eating across from a, a you know a first week production assistant. You know, obviously sometimes it bases on based on time. You know, like you try and get your lighting crew through, you know, cer certain crew members have to get through first so they can then go start setting things up for the next the next next part of the film while while everyone else is eating. But in general, I loved the family atmosphere of the projects that I worked on and that and it really is from the top up. I mean or from the top down. When you have producers, uh, directors, your leaders are the people that are setting good examples, it does trickle down. It creates the environment, just like when I was a teacher. Uh, the teacher sets the environment for the entire classroom, you know, and and kids and kids pick up on that. They're they surprisingly instinctive. So so. COVID has now forced us to, to separate. So you have, you know, eating, you know, you're like, you have like a, like a sticker and you're like area A or area B or area 2A. I'm, and, and so it's all segregated and it's, and it's segregated primarily based on kind of the, the film, where you are in the film status, like your work and things like that. Um, but, uh, so the other changes uh, besides cost is is obviously inclusion. Um, I, I saw uh, recently a couple of uh, of studios have made releases that that fifty percent of of all all behind the scenes, like it, like all staff, whether it's a uh, you know director, writer, uh, producers, from top to bottom. 50% must be uh, indigenous or POC. And it uh, has you know, to happen that way. That, I mean, they, they, ha they have to have that, huh? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, now the, those studios are push are, are, are making it. I think Warner Brothers, I think, was the one that, that came out with the first statement. Um, now, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to read there. You know, I mean, obviously, part of it is is it's it's big in the news. And so uh, you know, it does get positive, you know, PR. Um, but yeah, 50% is what some of the studios are going with. Uh, and, and, and there's obviously there's been a, a huge push, uh, for, for female inclusion as well. Uh, and some of those numbers still, you know, when you look at statistics, uh, still aren't very good. Uh, you know, I, you know, women in, in positions of power are growing fast. Uh, and part of it is just, uh, you know, the, like the head of Lionsgate or the head of a studio, you don't, you don't step down. It's not a, you know, I mean, it, it's not a position, you know, once you're at the top, you stay there until you retire or you make such a huge mistake that you're outed, right? It's not, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not something that you cycle through. So we are going to see a lot more uh, female writers, female directors, female producers well, uh, immediately. And the same thing with, 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 uh, with minority, re any, any minority representation. But those top positions are, are positions that people stay in for decades. They don't, they don't leave because, you know, a lot of them are the ones that, that built the company from the beginning and then it went public. And so uh, they, I mean, you know, they, they, be, they, they, their title changes, but that's about it. Um, so I think uh, I've been warned we have a few minutes left. Are there any other, yeah, it's such a, such a huge topic and there's so much, so much to cover. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Or comments. I mean, I'd I'd love to see. Uh, I think we might have to just with it being such short time, uh, we might have to uh, like have people write up questions uh, for for my next, you know, my next installment of this, 
and I could you know start much earlier with uh, with questions. Yes, so. in December, Neil will be speaking on relationships in the Hollywood entertainment industry. So yeah, that that's yeah, yeah that's that's gonna be a that's lot gonna of be an interesting one too <laughs> because it's all it also breaks. Uh, there's a lot of stereotypes, uh, and and obviously um, the idea that that people in the film business are 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 not you know there's a lot more cheating and there's you know there's you know i mean the the sleazy producer has gotten a lot of press over the last couple of years and obviously for good reason because the 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 bad <laughs> the bad men that have gotten a lot of press literally are really bad men and so they deserve every 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 tiny ounce of of bad press but it also then uh creates kind of a generalized idea of that job right mm -hmm. and that position and you know and 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 i know uh come growing up in the midwest the idea of kind of sleazy hollywood uh you know right. it, i mean of course it's sleazy but I worked in a law firm as soon as immediately out of graduate high school graduation. And, you know, half of them were really sleazy people. I mean, and that was in the Midwest. So every industry has it. So I'm, I'm really excited for that, that discussion, uh, at, you know, uh, next month because it's a, it's complicated, you know, it's a very complicated thing. And there are good people, you know, out there. Absolutely. As I mean, well. I mean, and so, couples that have been together for like decades in one Hollywood. A, yeah, one, a, one, a very good friend of mine, Mark Hamill from Sushi Girl. I mean, he, he effectively uh, stopped pursuing his big film career uh, as a leading man to be a father to his children. And, you know, he wanted to spend more time with his his wife Mary Lou and his three children. I have I you know that he is one of the best examples of a positive uh, male figure. Mark Dacascus is another one. Uh, you know I mean and it's funny because before each film that we worked on together, uh, you know he ended up uh, becoming a father. So it's like. <laughs> Uh, you know, his children's birthdays are connected to many of the films that we made together. So, yeah. And Mark Hamill's really good at uh, those comic cons. He he's he's got a good niche there. He's oh, got absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it used to be you know before before uh, the the great Stanley passed away, uh, you needed two people to be at a convention to make it an official convention. Right. Stanley and Mark Hamill. If you right. didn't have those two, yeah, you were you were just your your small your peanuts until you got those two to to show up. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Well, Neil, thank you so much for everything that you brought to us today, and I think it's been very enlightening. And Calvin, thank you for uh, pitching in some questions in there. And um, yeah, I think that next month's I almost said convention, but it's not a convention yet because it's still, you know, COVID and everything else. But <laughs> next month's summit on masculinity and relationships is going to be amazing. We have a lot of really incredible people that are coming up on the docket. So thanks again, Neil, for being here. And